All right, so the moment you've all been waiting for, we're giving Amy McAndrew the front stage. She's done such a great job throughout the pandemic with keeping us all informed. Uh, lots is new, a lot of it's unsettled, a lot of it's not known, but as always, Amy will kind of give us the latest and greatest and answer your questions, Amy. All right, thanks, Kevin. So good morning, everybody. Um, we thought that this would be a good opportunity given where we are, given everything that's going on with Omicron. Um, this would be a good time to just sort of do a, a more holistic update with regard to COVID, with regard to legal considerations. So the goal is to talk about each topic a little bit. Feel free to ask your questions through the chat or the Q&A. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, anything we don't get to, I'll incorporate in next week's um, presentation. So obviously, the, the, the first sort of interesting thing here is... Um, you know, what about that return to the physical workplace? So the last time we did an update like this, uh, uh, where I spent the majority of the town hall talking COVID um, was October 12th. And at that time, there was a lot of excitement, um, belief that we were all getting back to some sense of normalcy, we were getting some sense back to the way things kind of used to be, you know, with some improvements, arguably, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but at the same time, um, we've kind of hit a wall with Omicron. So I think there were a lot of employers, Apple is, is one a prominent employer who had originally had announced a return to the workplace in January um, and they've pushed that back. I know a lot of, um, in the legal community, a lot of law firms were planning to come back in January and they've pushed back um, as well as some uh, banks on Wall Street were saying the same thing. So um, it's sort of that kind of stay tuned and see what happens. Um, but at the same time, um, we've got, and, and this is the improvement that I was talking about, we've got more and more employers saying, we don't all need to be in the office every day to do our jobs. The last two years have proven that. We've seen a bunch of employers, PwC, Facebook, Twitter, saying, we're gonna let you mostly work from home. And then we have a bunch, uh, several other um, employers, some of them listed here saying, we're gonna do hybrid. Um, we, you know, we, we believe that, that that works for everybody. We'd like people in the office a couple of days for collaboration and, and some other reasons, but you know, we'll let you do a hybrid. And obviously, there are a couple of different concerns um, facing all of this. There's on the HR side, there's that productivity concern. And some employers have tried to, to um, find ways to measure productivity, things like keystrokes, things like monitoring activity at people's laptops. Uh, and and the, but the really the bigger issue, I think, for most people is the engagement in the culture. Um, how do we innovate? How do we collaborate when everybody's sitting um, in their home offices or at their kitchen table? Um, and so that remains a big concern. Um, and then, of course, from the legal side, we have other concerns. We have tax concerns. Um, how do I tax you if you're um, working out of your um, vacation home in Bermuda? Uh, immigration concerns. Are you allowed legally to work for a uh, U.S. employer if you're in your vacation home in Bermuda? So other concerns like that. And one of the things that I've seen um, with a lot of our members is given the challenges around recruitment and retention, some more employers have said, well, we're going to be mostly remote, so we are going to hire employees from anywhere. Um, we'll hire employees no matter what state, as long as they have the requisite skills. And we are seeing some challenges around that. Um, certainly there are some uh, workplaces, some states that are more employee friendly than others. California obviously comes to mind, but New York, Massachusetts, Colorado has kind of an interesting Equal Pay Act law that some employers have already found themselves running afoul of. Um, so there are lots of questions before you go ahead and do that, before you go ahead and say, I can have employees anywhere, there are legal considerations to think of. And then I don't know how many of you saw the 60 Minutes piece on Sunday night, I think it was called The Great Quit, um, or The Big Quit. Um, it said, one of the, the stats there, and they had somebody from LinkedIn on, and they said, employees are two and a half times more likely to apply for a job that is fully remote. Pre-pandemic, one in 67 jobs was remote, and now it's one in seven. So certainly things for employers to be thinking about if you have employees in your workforce who can work remotely. So we're going to ask a poll question, and today we have, I think, four poll questions. Um, and we're going to compare our answers to when we did this in October. So the first poll question is around remote work. If Ben, if we could get that up. Um, ask you, if you have employees who can work remotely, um, are they? And you can go ahead and vote right on your screen and we'll take these results and we'll compare them to, again, to what we saw back in October. This is pretty well split. Um, we've got 30% working remotely, 22% predominantly from the office, and then almost half working a hybrid schedule. And can we pull up 
from October. Oh, I have that actually. Never mind. If we go back to October, um, this tracks somewhat similarly, although um, the numbers have gone up a little bit, um, have gone down from hybrid and gone up a little bit with regard to um, working predominantly from the office. And I think what that probably reflects is what was happening pre-Omicron. We were trying to get back to the office, right? We were trying to get people back to some sense of normalcy. Um, and keep in, and we have 138 responses to the current poll, 114 responses to the poll back in October. So the numbers are a little bit different, but okay, interesting. And we'll send it, we'll, when we send out the slides, you guys will get all these results. So you'll be able to see. Um, so we've, to the extent we are, in the physical workplace, um, we need to be thinking about safety. Again, I think back in the fall, numbers were down. Um, more, some employers had dropped their masking requirement. And so this is something to be thinking about. Um, the CDC guidelines on this have not changed um, substantially in the last six-ish months. Um, CDC guidelines say uh, everybody should be wearing masks indoors in areas of higher substantial community transmission, and that's almost everywhere. That includes pretty much everywhere in the Delaware Valley. Um, unvaccinated individuals should mask indoors regardless of the community transmission rates. Um, and you, we see this changes a little bit by locality. Philadelphia, um, for businesses and institutions that don't require everyone who enters to be vaccinated, everyone on site is supposed to be wearing a mask. And Delaware just implemented this morning um, their mask mandate for businesses who are open to the public. So this, if you're a business who is closed to the public, this does not apply to you, but it certainly reflects the idea of our increased case counts and what's going on with o Omicron. So, you know, maybe you are thinking about, I know a lot of employers said, we're going to let everybody work from home the first couple of weeks of January, given everything that's going on. But if you are bring, bringing people back to the workplace, whether it's hybrid or otherwise, maybe you want to think about this and maybe it's time to reconsider um, what your masking, um, what your masking practices should be. Should everybody be masked or just your unvaccinated employees? In all spaces or just public spaces? We've heard for a long time, if you're in a private office, if you're alone, you don't have to wear a mask. What if you're in a cubicle? Can you maintain physical distancing of six feet or more? Um, should the mask be mandatory or voluntary? I think for the most part, voluntary masking is not as helpful. Um, unless you're wearing a medical grade mask, um, my mask protects you, your mask protects me. Um, so the voluntariness usually is not helpful. You need to make it mandatory. And then for visitors, if your employees are gonna be masked, I think your visitors should be masked too. And then you just have overall considerations, your density, how easy is it to socially distance? It might be one thing if you're in a huge warehouse versus if you're in a small office, um, how much interaction do your employees have with the public? And then of course, vaccination and testing. And we'll talk about that more as I'm sure you can imagine. So I think we have another poll around masking. And I like, I'm curious to see how this compares to October. Are you requiring masks in the workplace? Yes, for unvaccinated only. Yes, for everyone, undecided or no. All right, so yes, uh, for all employees, 62%. Um, yes, for unvaccinated individuals, only 14%. And then no for 20%. And so let's see how that compares to what we were doing back in October. And those numbers are interesting. Um, it was yes for everyone, including visitors back at 37%, yes for employees only at 11%. So we've certainly seen that masking number go up, which reflects what's going on in the world right now, which is we probably need to be a little bit more careful. All right. Something to think about if you have employees who travel, you know, I don't think we're returning to the summer of 2020 where we had travel restrictions and we have to be monitoring where our employees are going on vacation. However, keep in mind if your employees do go on vacation out of the country, there is a chance they will get stuck out of the country. Um, you need a negative test to come back into the US whether you are vaccinated or unvaccinated. Um, but if you do have employees who are traveling for business, whether international or domestic, these are certainly things to be thinking about. Um, what do you want to do um, around testing when they come back? What, what might you want to do around quarantine when they come back? So this is what's um, up for international travel. Vaccinated travelers, uh, again, negative test to return to the U.S., get tested with a viral test three to five days after travel, self-monitor for COVID symptoms, obviously isolate if you, get, if you develop symptoms. Unvaccinated, again, the negative test, get tested with a viral test three to five days after travel and stay home. Um, to quarantine, even with a negative test, and then self-monitor. And then domestic, 
Vaccinated travels, travelers don't really need to do anything otherwise other than self-monitoring, but unvaccinated get tested um, three to five days after travel and stay home and self-quarantine and then self-monitor for symptoms. So again, it's something to think about if this is mostly if you have employees who are traveling for business, what are you going to do? And as we know, and I'll talk more about, um, tests are hard to come by these days. Um, so it, it certainly is something to think about with regard to um, testing. So I need to talk about the ETS and, and I before we got on this morning, I kept refreshing my computer to see if there was anything going on with this. Um, as you know, uh, ETS, this is the large employer um, mandatory vaccine um, executive order um, that where OSHA issued the emergency temporary standard. It has been on hold um, in December. Um, Sixth Circuit Court, Court of Appeals dissolved that on hold, dissolved the stay, and then um, appeals were immediately filed to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court heard oral arguments on Friday. Um, and I think there was some hope that the Supreme Court would come out with a decision um, yesterday because uh, yesterday, January 10th, is the day that, that OSHA has said they're going to start enforcing the ETS. But so far, nothing. Um, everything I've read, and this doesn't, you know, this is not definitive by any stretch, but everything I've read suggests that most people who know these things think that the um, Supreme Court will reinstate the stay or that basically the ETS will go away after the Supreme Court's ruling. But again, that's not definitive and we kind of need to, to wait and see. We certainly have seen the Supreme Court punt on things before, so it's possible that something like that happens as well. Um, Pennsylvania has published a readiness guide that may provide some assistance to Pennsylvania employers. We're gonna give you a link to that in the email that comes out after um, today's webinar. I don't think it's super helpful, but it does have some information in there on testing and testing, you know, maybe resources for finding testing. I know that's a, a huge issue right now is that individuals can't find tests, employers can't find tests. Even if you can get an appointment for a test, it's several days out. It might take several days to get the results. Um, and then, of course, there are always questions, whether it's you're, you're doing um, testing for traveling or some other reason, what type of test do you need um, to make sure that those results are valid? And so this statement, and again, I checked at 1045 right before we came on, this statement remains on OSHA's website. Um, and I won't read the whole thing, but um, basically uh, employers had until January 10th, which was yesterday to develop their compliant policies and until February 9th to begin their testing programs if that's the way that employers decide to go. So this is very, I've said this before, I've raised this analogy before, this is very reminiscent of what happened during the Obama administration with regard to um, the Department of Labor raising the salary threshold for exempt employees. Um, President Obama or his administration put in the changes. A lot of employers reacted and made the changes and then a, a court in Texas put everything on hold and it all went away. Um, so you, you certainly hate as an employer to, to do all of this work only to have the ETS never go into effect. But at the same time, I do, I, I do think you need to be ready and I think there's things you can do and I've been talking about this for since November, but I think there's things you can do that you really want to be doing anyway. So I haven't put all the requirements of the ETS in here that no reason to do that unless or until the Supreme Court rules and we see what's going to happen. But you can go back on the website. We have um, slides from the, the past um, town halls and including the November 9th one where there are more comprehensive um, slides. So but the one thing you should be doing, I think everybody should be doing, is to track employer vaccination. It's very easy. Get a copy of the card. Um, again, it is a medical. We've talked about this before. It's a medical record. Keep it confidential. Um, but I think that's that's definitely something that employers should be doing because, as we see, and we'll talk about in a minute, whether or not employees vaccinated makes a difference for quarantine purposes if they've had an exposure. Um, and then supporting vaccination by uh, providing employees reasonable time for vaccination and recovery. There is no other requirement, there is no other federal requirement out there to give people time off to get vaccinated, um, to recover from vaccination, to quarantine or isolate. There's nothing else out there besides the CTS on a federal level. There are some local things um, out there. So if you have employees in states other than Pennsylvania, um, you may want to inquire for uh, members, feel free to reach out to hotline. New York, for example, has some requirements around employees who are quarantining um, or isolating. But there is no other federal requirement out there um, to provide this time off. But it is something employers need to be thinking about. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. 
Um, and then of course there's the vaccine or test. Are you going to mandate vaccines um, or are you going to test? Um, how do you test in light of all the testing shortages that are going on right now? It's really something to be thinking about to, to um, and again, that uh, Pennsylvania readiness guide does have some information out there um, about testing, but if you haven't already, you should be sourcing um, uh, testing, um, uh, whether you're going to do testing on site, you're going to do testing off site, if you're going to contract with someone to do your testing. Um, and then, of course, the federal contractor um, government vaccine mandates, uh, that one is on hold even more or, or longer. We're not expected to get a ruling on that until at least late January. All right, so we do also know though, no matter whether you're a large employer or a small employer, you can require the COVID vaccine. Um, at this point, the, there have been numerous lawsuits. They have gone in favor of private employers. Um, as long as you have a, a legitimate health and, and safety reason, you have business necessity. So basically you don't have all of your employees working from home. You have some interaction with the public or if you even need to come on site, um, you can require the COVID vaccine if you want. Some employers, we've gotten this question a lot on, on hotline. What about requiring the booster? Again, you can. it seems highly likely that as an employer, you can do that, even though CDC has not yet included the booster as part of their definition of fully vaccinated. Um, of course, you need to think about religious and medical exemptions if you're going to do a vaccine mandate. Um, you have to grant the, the exceptions unless it's an undue burden for medical reasons or the employee throws, uh, poses an undue threat. The threshold is much lower for religious. Um, so if you do decide to go this route and you are a member, please talk to Hotline, please talk to Member Legal Services. We can guide you through this. Or if you're not a member, you know, definitely talk to legal counsel about going down that road. Oop. All right. So I want, I'm curious to see if this number changes at all from October 2. We have a question, a uh, poll question. Are you requiring your employees to be vaccinated? All right, still predominantly no. 70% say no, 27% saying yes. Um, and how does that compare to when we did this in October? Pretty similar, um, pretty similar percentage of respondents. Although the yes has certainly gone up but the undecided has gone down. Interesting, okay. So again, coming back to testing, um, can you require testing for employees? Um, yes, EEOC has said yes. Um, should you do it for all employees or just unvaccinated employees? Certainly now in Omicron, maybe if you're going to test, you test for everybody. But when do you test? Again, tests are in short supply. If you have employees traveling, maybe you require them to get a, to get a test before they get on a plane. Um, there are lots of different options out there, the PCR test, the rapid test, self-testing. Um, the problem with the PCR tests a lot of times is that it can take a long time to get those results, rendering them largely meaningless. So you really need to think about what works for you. A lot of discussion um, here on these town halls as to who pays for the testing. Um, there are statutes in both Pennsylvania and New Jersey that suggest at least that um, the employer may be responsible for paying for the testing. What I thought was really in interesting, again, in this Pennsylvania readiness guide, um, Pennsylvania had the, the, one of the things they talk about is paying for testing. So they had the absolute opportunity there to say, oh, there's a Pennsylvania law that says that employers need to pay for testing. And they do not say that there, not definitive by any stretch. Um, but it, it's somewhat suggestive that maybe Pennsylvania is not taking that position. You think if they were taking that position, they would say that. Um, so for the, for the most part, employers probably can um, require employees to pay for testing. Again, different states have different laws. The problem with that is if you're going to require your employees to pay for testing, given the very difficult um, market we have for uh, um, hiring and for retention, if you're forcing your employees to pay for testing, that may be the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back and that may cause you to lose employees. Who pays for time spent testing? Keep in mind that if you have non-exempt hourly employees and you are requiring them to get tested, you, are, you pay for that time. That is working time. Um, DOL has said that uh, pretty definitively at this point, and there will be lawsuits on that. Um, another issue, this is getting a lot of attention on hotline. Um, we know FFCRA um, is no longer with us, so the federal requirement that you give employees time off, um, paid time off to stay home when they've been exposed or when they um, are sick or, or uh, other reasons related to COVID, but we still really as employers want to encourage sick employees to stay home. Um, is that time off paid or unpaid? Do you expand PTO? What do you do? Do you require a negative test to return? 
Um, suggestions to that are no, um, again, because it's so hard to get testing and also because an employee can test positive for weeks even when they are no longer um, contagious. Do you require a doctor's note to return? Again, access to the uh, medical community made me more difficult right now. Um, I was just reading this morning about how more and more employer, uh, more and more physicians offices are not even letting you come in um, if you have any symptoms that might be COVID related and that's all telemedicine. So do you, is it worth it to get a doctor's note through telemedicine to have somebody return? You know, that's a, a call for you to make. Um, so we are seeing a lot of employers not expand PTO, um, not expand the paid time off, but certain, certainly giving employees unpaid days off. That can get a little bit complicated if you have exempt employees, salaried employees, because there are rules around that. So again, if you have questions about that, um, and if you are a member, feel free to reach out to Hotline or Member Legal Services and we can talk you through that. But we do have, I think this is our final po poll of the day with regard to what are you doing around PTO um, in times of COVID to encourage employees to stay home. Great. Um, so have you changed your PTO policy to encourage sick or exposed employees to stay home? Yes, no, or undecided? All right. And then the majority, again, 68% is saying no. Um, so again, uh, pretty similar to what we saw um, back in October, although um, the yeses have gone up a little bit and the undecideds have gone down a little bit. So um, that's what your, your peer organizations are doing. Okay. A um, couple other things I wanted to touch on. Um, the lawsuits are here. Uh, some of the, the large um, international labor and employment law firms are tracking, um, doing uh, COVID litigation tracking. Um, the, one of the ones that I like to look at is Littler. Um, since March of 2020, they're saying there have been almost 5,000 lawsuits filed against employers due to alleged labor and employment violations due to the pandemic. Um, states with the most filings include, ding, 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 um, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania are on that list. I don't think California surprises anybody, but um, certainly New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania are high up there as well. Um, over 2,500 of these, so more than half, include a claim for retaliation. And if you've ever been through um, MEA's um, anti-harassment uh, training, or if it, I have ever done your training, when, one of the things I usually say during that training is not always the crime, it's the cover-up. Um, even if you as an employer um, make a mistake with an employee, uh, how you react to that mistake or that possible mistake is as important um, as anything else. Um, and that's how employers often get themselves in trouble with regard to retaliation. You should remember that COVID and long haul COVID may be disabilities under the ADA. So that has really layered in, you know, employers had enough trouble dealing with ADA pre pandemic. I think um, the pandemic has made dealing with ADA type issues, including reasonable accommodation, that much more complicated. Um, so do keep in mind those reasonable accommodation concerns. One of the things I'm seeing a fair amount with members is we've got employees who don't want to come back to the office and they're coming up with an ADA reason as to why they don't have to come back to the office. And a lot of employers are getting frustrated and trying to reject that. Don't reject it out of hand. At least go through a process. Talk to counsel um, before you make that decision and at least know what your um, potential uh, uh, concerns are, what your potential risks are around that. And I did want to put um, these guidelines up again because CDC tweaked them again. Um, so we'll have, again, these uh, slides will be available to you um, in the email that goes out after the webinar. Um, but we've got the guidance for isolation and quarantine. Um, if you have COVID, you should isolate for five days. Um, if you're symptomatic or your symptoms are resolving, which means, you know, things are getting better, no fever for 24 hours without the use of fever reducing medications. You follow that by five days of wearing a mask um, with, you know, to minimize um, the possibility of exposure, exposing other people. Um, there is something in the CDC guidance about um, uh, differentiating between mild uh, COVID and more um, serious symptoms. I'm not sure exactly where that line is, but they're saying if you have more serious COVID, you should actually isolate for 10 days. So it's a little bit more difficult to figure out where that line might be. To calculate that five-day isolation period, um, day zero is the day symptoms began, or if you are um, asymptomatic, day zero is the day that you test and you get that negative test or you get that positive test, sorry. Um, so it's not, I test and then three days later, I get a positive test. So that's day zero, because that wouldn't really make any sense. Um, it's the day that you actually test. And then of course, we've got exposure as well. This means you've been exposed to somebody who has COVID or who likely has COVID. And this is where we differentiate between the uh, vaccinated versus unvaccinated people who have been boosted and who have not been boosted. 
Um, so if you're unvaccinated and you're more than six months out from your last vaccine and not been boosted, it's a five-day, this is a recommendation for a five-day quarantine followed by five days of strict mask use. This has been controversial because um, it's not a, you know, it's the, the CDC is kind of saying, um, or has been saying, well, if you can't isolate, or if you can't quarantine, then go ahead and go about your business and wear a mask. Um, again, day zero is the day of the initial exposure. Day one is the day after that. If you have re reached your booster, if you have received your booster, um, you don't need to wear to quarantine, just wear a mask. Um, this is a this is one of the new additions here. Best practice would include a test day five after exposure. If symptoms occur, uh, immediately quarantine until a negative test confirms they're not attributable to COVID-19. All right, so a lot of information right there, but I want to make sure that we are able to get to Ben and Kara, but I do see tons of questions coming in. Lots of questions. Um, and I'm gonna go try to go through quickly. And, and um, you know, we'll try to hit some of these a little more depth next week. We'll recover some of these. Um, uh, definition of vaccination for travelers it doesn't include being a booster right if you're for the travel right now um yeah boosted is is not included in the definition of fully vaccinated but it is something to think about as an employer um how do i want to you can define fully vaccinated slightly differently if you want um and uh, somebody has a question about a manager burnout kind of policing the mask requirement. I think that's too long for us to answer here but if you are uh, bill if you're a member just give us a call we can uh, have you talked to one of our training and coach and just give you some thoughts about kind of how to manage that process. Um, let's see. Uh, someone asked how people are dealing with the large number of people out for Omicron. That's a great topic to throw into our new community platform. So after this, if you want to put that out there as part of a, a chat, I think that's a really good thing to hear what people are, you know, how we're managing this because I think everyone's had an impact of someone they know who's gotten COVID in the last couple of weeks. Um, anyone have a way to automatic automated tests of weekly tracking? Someone referred to their payroll company. I think a lot of payroll are setting up automated systems. If you do have to do that, so I would check with your payroll provider. Um, someone said, do we have to start the weekly testing until yet or after it's manned? The ETS goes in effect. I think Amy, you said it's not until after the Supreme Court decision. Um, do we know yet whether the vaccine is a once and done or will be an annual vaccine? I think we all are wondering that question, Terry. So <laughs> I, just, I was just reading yesterday that um, they're going to come up with a new booster for Omicron. So stay tuned. Yeah, um, I think a lot of these about the tracking. So I think that, you know, there will be if we if the ETS passes, will be if you're a large employer with a lot of people have to test, I think there'll be some options available. So we're going to keep that off until we see what happens there. And I'm hoping by next Tuesday, we'll have a decision from the Supreme Court. Maybe we'll have a little bit more clarity. Yeah, I think some of these you answered, you don't have to get a negative test because someone may be positive past their um, period that they can transfer it. Um, can we reject an applicant due to medical exemption as an under 50 company? I'm not sure I know what that's referring to. Amy, I guess no, there's something yeah. under, uh, below the FMLA standards. Um, Again, if you're a member, feel free to call that one into hotline. Okay, someone made a reference that they've just announced private insurance to cover home testing costs. Um, that goes in effect Saturday. I think you, that's true. You still have to find out how you're going to get reimbursed. Um, you can buy, I mean, I bought quite a number of tests online. You can get packs of two for like $14 these days if you want to make them available for anybody. Um, and I tend to think if you're a small employer, it's probably pretty easy to buy up a bunch of tests and make them available to your employees. I think it just gets com more complicated the more employees you have and the more expensive it gets. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we just have I've seen status gathering piece. Uh, we don't know the date the Supreme Court's going to rule. We are all watching every day for that. Um, we just started the vaccine gathering. An employee has refused stating that he will comply when the Supreme Court decides. Um, what do you suggest somebody do? Well, well keep I'll in let mind, you answer that one, Amy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, keep in mind that you as the employer, you can make these decisions. As I said, you can mandate vac vaccination, you can mandate masks, you can mandate social distancing. Now, it becomes laborious um, to enforce some of this stuff, but you certainly can make those decisions as long as you have a good business reason for doing it and you're not discriminating against people on the basis of some sort of a disability. But again, if you're a member, feel free to, to buzz into hotline or to... to get in touch with me and we can talk about it. 
Um, and I think one thing you would do, if someone doesn't tell you the vaccine, vaccination status, that's where you would say, okay, we, here's our rules. If, you don't, if we don't know your status, you either wear your mask or you've got to do weekly testing, you can turn it into the, what do they have to do instead? Um, somebody pointed out that the recent OSHA FAQ says you do not have to count international locations towards your 100 count threshold. So I don't know, I haven't seen that, but I haven't looked for it. Um, good question here to finish this out. Uh, if someone is exposed after just returning from a positive test, do they have to quarantine again or they assume be immune? There is something I was just reading through everything the CDC had on this this morning, and there is something in there about having had recently had COVID. I believe, but double check it, I believe that what they say is no, if you've had COVID in the last 90 days, you would not need to quarantine. So. Well, a lot of stuff covered. Uh, thank you, Amy. And we'll, uh, we'll keep this uh, going each week because I'm sure more is going to be happening as well as the trend of uh, Omicron and other, uh, you know, what the impact is on some of the rules and regulations. But thank you very much.